in this teaching. And not only that, but even those in our day that don't even go to church, not religious, maybe even would say they don't believe in God, still know a lot of the things within the Sermon on the Mount. For example, the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount talks about the Beatitudes or the Lord's Prayer, which most anyone would recognize is given in the Sermon on the Mount. The Golden Rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, people know that. The, 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 the principles within the Sermon on the Mount have been used to form governments all over the world. Uh, whether they actually realized it or not, the teachings of Jesus have made a major impact. It was Pastor Daniel who told us uh, at the very beginning of this series that the Sermon on the Mount is the masterpiece of ethical and religious training. And this is true. It is the Mount Everest. It is the peak of Mount Everest within the scriptures because Jesus summarizes it all. So all the more reason that we should be looking at it. And as we draw this series to the close, uh, we are going to finish with the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, those of you who have been here for more than a couple of Sundays, have you enjoyed this series through the, through the Sermon on the Mount? Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you have. It has been life-changing even for me, as I've uh, brought the messages to you the, over these past few weeks, it's just incredible how the teachings of Jesus come alive. You know, and that's because we read a living Word of God. It's a, it's, it's a Bible that as we read it, as we take it in, it, it, it can teach us new things. Reading the same passages over and over, the Holy Spirit speaks to us in different ways. It's an incredible uh, living Word. So, uh, as we look at it today, if you're there, I, I just want to give you the quick review, since we are finishing today, where we have been. Because Jesus gives us our marching orders as people who are citizens of the kingdom. <coughs> he gives us those marching orders. And so, what are the marching orders? Well, let's just go in the order of the Sermon on the Mount. And that's why I wanted you to be there in 5, 6, and 7. Chapter 5 begins, Jesus calls the disciples to himself, that's you and me. And he says, hey, let's, let's talk. And he says, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he gives those beatitudes. And those are a description, a characteristic, a character list, maybe a checklist of the way a citizen of the kingdom behaves. The poor in spirit, the meek, the humble, the hung, the hunger, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, peacemakers, those who are merciful. These are the people that this is what a kingdom citizen looks like. Now, most of us can't measure up to that, but we have to have a measure, right? And that is the measure that Jesus gives. The people of the citizens of the kingdom are different than the people who are in the world that do not believe in Christ, do not follow him. People who are not disciples of Jesus. There should be a difference. Our mission to be salt and light, that's the next thing he talks about there. We're not to be separate from the world, but to be in the world. Not of the world, but in the world, being salt and light. And he, he talks very clearly that our guidebook is the scripture. And throughout the scripture itself, it speaks to how important it is for us to be grounded in the Bible. A lot of folks may even think that, in the, especially in the Baptist arena, that we, we hold up the Bible and we worship the Bible. That is not true and shouldn't be true. Certainly there are probably some that do. We do not worship the Bible. We worship the God whose testimony comes through the Bible. But it is God's word and there is no other. And it is the word that's given to us and speaks to our heart and speaks to every situation. It is the word where we find life where we find that relationship with Jesus. So the Bible is critical to the life of the disciple of Jesus. And Jesus made that clear. He didn't come to, to uh, get rid of the Bible, get rid of the Old Testament. He came to fulfill it and to show us what it means to live by it. He also gives the Lord's Prayer, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, which really re-educates us on what prayer is, which is, Getting in line with God, finding out where God is, and getting on board with Him. That's what prayer is. Prayer is not God getting God on board with you, which is how most of us pray. God, I need this. I need this. Can you bless this? I'm going to be doing this. Can you bless, bless it? 
I'm going here. Can you go with me? Instead of, what are you doing, God? How can I serve you? The total devotion is required. He talked about you cannot serve two masters. And it talks about where to find peace that God provides for us. He said, hey, look at the lilies of the field. Look at the birds of the air. God takes care of them. He's going to take care of you. So you shouldn't worry. Seek first God. Talks about don't judge people. Don't condemn people. But live a life as someone who helps others. Who helps others find the truth. Who helps others find the way. And when we see others that are doing wrong, not to ignore it, but give them the right direction in the spirit of love. Remember that God is gracious. He reminds us. He says, you guys, you're, you're par- as parents, you give good gifts to your children. How much more would God do that for you? God is always on the edge of his seat, ready to give us what we need. He is generous. And do unto others, of course, that's the golden rule. Do unto others, do good for others. And if uh, we said, if you don't have anything good to say, find something good and then say it. Not if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all, which is the common phrase, because that is simply not doing bad. And the Christian life, the disciple of Jesus, is more than just about not doing bad things. God wants you to do good things. He wants you to be proactive. He wants you to be in the world, ministering, being his hands and feet. You cannot do that by just simply not doing bad things. Then he talked about seeking the narrow path. That he, Jesus always laid on the line. He never shrunk back from saying that it's a tough life to live the life that God calls us to live. It's not always easy. It's definitely not always popular. But it is worth living and it leads to life. And now, uh, by the way, I wanted to, I was talking to a couple people uh, uh, later in the week on that Sunday, after that Sunday, and I want you to understand that that following Christ is hard to do. It is hard to make that commitment and to stick with it against the, the criticism of the world around us. However, that does not mean we serve Christ with a bad attitude or a negative attitude. Oh, woe is me. I can't, you know, I've got to live this life of Jesus. Uh, this is what God wants me to do. You know, and we're the Eeyores of the, of the world following Jesus. No, no. We need to be the Tiggers of the world, to keep with that analogy. We need to be those who are bouncing around and saying, God is great and He is good. And I am happy and filled with joy because of the Lord who loves me. It's not always easy. But I will always hang on to God and I can always hang on to the joy that he gives me. A little bit different. So, and then stay connected to Jesus. Last week we had a very uh, incredible message out of the, right before the verses we're going to read today, which said, Jesus said, those, not everybody who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But only those who do the will of my Father. And then he talked about people who call in Lord, Lord and do great things, but they don't have the relationship. They know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. And the scripture is very clear from the beginning to the end that it's not about what you do. It's not about your good works versus your bad works when you get to the gate in heaven. It's about who you know. Do you know Jesus? Personally, not just about him, but do you know him? So this Jesus that we're talking about, he's bringing this message to a close, this powerful message. By now, the disciples are speechless. They're sitting there uh, so much. It's like drinking from the fire hose. They're, oh, Jesus, please, let's wrap this up. I, I, my, you know, my notes, are fi- my page is filled. What more could you possibly say? And Jesus finishes like he does so many times when he was teaching with a great story. Because Jesus was the master storyteller. In fact, if you would, on the back of your bulletin is a place to follow along, take some notes. I'm going to give some references. You can write them down, jot them down so you can look them up later. And make sure that what we're talking about here today, uh, I'm not making it up. But Jesus was an incredible storyteller. That was his specialty. Specialty, And after all, doesn't everybody love a good story? We all do. 
And we just look forward to it. In fact, we just hear the beginning and we want to tune in. It's like, uh, once upon a time, and we all lean forward. What? What? Or a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> you know? Or we, we think about others, uh, other storylines. Uh, there once was a man. Or even on a lower level, there was a Baptist, a priest, and a rabbi. And they went into a bar, you know? And we go, what? You see, there's something about a story. There's something about when you, when you even you, if you give truth with a story, it's something that draws us in. And Jesus knew that. What? An incredible teacher. No wonder the people crowded around. It's like this guy. Have you heard this guy yet? He is good. I can't wait. I hope he tells the one about the prodigal son. You know? That was awesome. Uh, oh, wait. If he starts talking about the uh, guy, the, uh, you know, the Samaritan, you, you know, I'm not telling you. No spoilers here. But you're going to be so shocked. The good Samaritan. He, Jesus had twists and turns and he painted pictures that just drew people in. And they, as they were listening to him, it almost always at the end of it, you know, Jesus would give that, that closer, that, the, 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 the line that they go, and everybody went, what? You know? It was just amazing. And that's partly because there's just a couple of things about a story. It's something to see, number one. Jesus knew that it's illustrations. If he painted pictures that people of all, whether no matter what their education, no matter how old they were, no matter how young they were, if I tell a story, even the youngest child, if they understand what I'm saying, is drawn in. See, they can understand it. And Jesus knew that. So he didn't, he didn't teach. He didn't lecture. He, he gave stories because he was opening it up to everyone. He was throwing the door wide open. Another thing about stories that we need to know is they're easy to remember. It's much easier to remember than Jesus. You know, we, most of us can't, can't name all ten commandments without looking. And that's only ten things. But, but Jesus tells a story and we can remember all kinds of details, right? Things that illustrate the Ten Commandments, we can just say, oh yeah, Jesus said this, Jesus said that, and we, we quote the story. Because a story is easy to remember instead of a list or a lecture. And not only that, but a story is easy to repeat. You know, just like a good joke or a good story, oh, did you hear what happened to, you know, and we tell it. Maybe not quite accurately, but we tell it. And sometimes as accurately because we remember it. A good story is easy to remember. Jesus was always visual. Talked about the prodigal son, the lost sheep, the good Samaritan. He talked about the birds of the field and the flowers. When he talked about faith, he likened it to a mustard seed. When he talked about how we live our lives, he talked about how the sower sows the seeds. And boy, those people knew what that was. Are we able to do that? To tell the stories like Jesus told them? So Jesus is perfectly makes sense that the finish of the greatest message recorded by Jesus is an illustration, a story. And so I want you to look at it with me today. If you're there right now, it is Matthew chapter 7, and it begins with verse 24. And we're just going to read to the end of the chapter. Jesus says, <coughs> Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this 
this finish, this story to end this greatest message of all time. We ask that even though it's familiar to us that you would apply something in it, a principle, anything that would draw us closer to you that would make us more of your disciples that you called us and created us to be. God, enlighten us. Let your voice be heard and all others fade into the background. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Story of two houses. Yes, you know it. You remember it. You think about it a lot. It was, this was in the Sermon on the Mount. It was the, it was the big finish. It was Jesus bringing it all to a close, giving that one last final truth that wrapped it all together. And so we want to look at some of the pieces of it and see what it might mean for us today. First of all, it is a story of two houses. It is two foundations, but it's also two houses. And throughout this whole message, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, remember that Jesus has given two things. You cannot serve two masters. He talked about the narrow way and the wide way. He talked about it was always two different things. You always have a choice. He talked about it throughout this message, and so he finishes with this. Two houses. Let me tell you something that is similar about them. When you look at a parable, it's important to know that there are the similar things, and then you pay attention to the things that are different. So let's go. The first thing that's similar is everybody builds a house, right? I mean, you all are drawing breath in here, I hope, and then you're, you're, you're all alive, you're living life, you're doing things in your life. All of us are unique. All of us have a unique life. Our houses look different. However, we're all building a house, a life. Everybody is. Maybe yours is, is, uh, is one where the yellow tape is up and you're just kind of waiting. Or maybe there's a lot of flurry going on and your, ho- your house has got a lot of work going on it right now. But everybody builds a house. Everyone is on a journey. Everyone is living a life. Everyone, no matter the size or shape of your house. The second thing is it rains on everybody. Oh, what a bummer. But it does. I want you to see that not only that, Jesus specifically says it exactly, by the way, exactly Word for word, the same storm, the same rain, wind, it comes to both houses. He says it exactly the same because he doesn't want you beyond a shadow of a doubt. He didn't just say, and there was a little rain that hit the other. No, 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 no. This is the same storm. Because storms in life come, don't they? Anybody, their life's perfect, never had a storm. You just perfect weather all your whole life. Okay. Good. I'm glad everybody's honest this morning because everybody's life has storms. Sometimes they come up very quickly, don't they? They come up and you say, wow, I didn't see that coming. Oh, we say, that threw me a curveball. Or, or, wow, I don't know what I'm going to do. I never planned for that. Those surprises. But they come. Storms can come up quickly. They did on the Sea of Galilee. These guys that are sitting listening to Jesus right now, they know that sometimes a storm can come very quickly. And then there's times when you look out and you go, looks like rain. And the temperature changes a little bit and the wind begins to blow and you say, it's going to rain. There's a storm coming, right? You can see it coming. And so you have that opportunity to prepare and you think about it and you prepare for it and the storm comes. But we, one thing's for sure. Storms come. And by the way, maybe storms have come in your life and you can check them off and you can say, well, I'm glad my, the storms in my life are over. Oh, they're not over. There's more storms coming. Maybe even today. In this beautiful sunshine day, it's a, it's a nice fall day. The sun is shining. There's not a cloud in the sky. There could be a storm for you today. I, I, I don't know. Everybody builds a house, and it rains and storms on everybody's house. Checked your roof lately? Oh, wait a minute. It's really not the roof isn't the most important thing. Jesus says, and the third thing is that the foundation of the house 
determines its survival. The foundation of the house determines its survival. In both houses, it's the foundation that determines the result. Everybody builds a house. Everybody's house is going to get storms. And what determines if your house stands or falls is the foundation. Okay? We good? And Jesus says, you, your house, if it's going to survive, it needs an anchor. It needs a rock. It, it, it needs to be a house that sits on something. Everybody's house sits on something, by the way. Your house isn't floating out there. Your house has a foundation. The question is, what is your house sitting on? This life that you are building, what is it sitting on? So Jesus gives two options. Again, it's just the two. There's not a 10, 15 options, you know. Here's the, and you can get extras and, you know, add-ons and things. No, 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 there's two. The sand and the rock. Uh, let me tell you about how important the foundation is in case you, you're not thinking of it, and, and I want you to see it in Scripture as well. This isn't the first time the Scripture talks about founding our life on something. The first thing is the foundation has to be solid, correct? Jesus said it's the rock or the sand. The difference, a rock is solid, sand is shifting. It has to be solid. So what is that? What foundation could be solid for us? I gave you some scripture verses. We're going to look at a couple right now. In Psalm 46, verse 1, <coughs> it says, God is our refuge and our strength, our very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and our strength. Very present help in times of trouble. I like that. I like that especially the last, we think of refuge and strength. We hear that a lot. But the very present help, because when I need help, I need it right now. I need somebody to be with me right now. Not, I'll be there in a minute. He's our very present help in times of trouble. You in trouble? You got a storm coming? Jesus is there, you see if our foundation is solid. Another great psalm, Psalm 18, verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in case you didn't get it the first time, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Does that sound solid? Sound solid to you? That's the Lord. That's the Lord. Well, if I'm going to build my life upon something that's solid, if it has that foundation needs to be solid, it needs to be the Lord. The final one I listed there for you is Psalm 62, verse 5 through 7. For God alone, my, oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from Him. He only is my rock. I, I, I chose this particular, there's tons of verses about God being our rock, but this one, for He only is my rock. And my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation, my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. A foundation has to be solid. And according to the scripture, that solid foundation is God. He does not change. We change. We change every day. As we grow, we change. But God stays the same. He's unchangeable. He is solid. He is our rock. He is what we need to hold on to. Not men's ideas, not traditions, not even religion or religious activities, not pleasure, not popularity. Only God is our rock. So it has to be solid. It also has to be laid down first. Whew, you don't want to be building a house and then say, oh, I forgot to put the foundation down. Right? Has to be laid first. Is, am I correct? It, it's, it's, the foundation goes first. We, you plant the foundation. You make sure it's solid, but you do it first. In Matthew 6, 33, Jesus, which is in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Your house is to be built on the, on the rock, which is God, but that needs to start with God. It needs to start with a personal relationship with the Lord. You know, there are a lot of people, now listen to me, there's a lot of people who try to slip the foundation in under the house that they have built. You follow me on that? 
It's like when they realize they haven't built their house on the rock, the unchangeable rock, the, the, they go, well, I, I, I mean, I've done this really great house, though. I've made this awesome life. I've got all this position and power and great stuff. Maybe if I get a few friends, we can pick up the house and get a couple friends. Can you slide that under there? You know what I'm talking about? Slide it under. We'll hold it up. Come on. No, the other way. No. Yes. Wait, as soon as I do, I'm slipping. I'm slipping. You've seen people do that, haven't you? In some project, in some kind of, you know, let's try to slip in step one, even though we're already on step nine. I want you to know that some of us say, we need to say, I want to start with Jesus. What I have built up is no longer. And start building on the foundation of Jesus. Jesus may, by the way, Jesus may use the material, some of the materials that you've, that you've had to tear down in order to put, in other words, to put this uh, foundation in. But the house has to come down for it to be built properly. The foundation has to be laid first. Let, let me tell you the third thing. It must be connected. You know, you've got to be connected to the foundation. You can't just put it on the foundation and hope that that house is not going to slide off that rock when the wind blows. Because I'll tell you, the wind will blow so hard that if it's not connected to the foundation, it will blow off. That's where we just rewind a couple of verses back to where Jesus said, you know, a lot of people think, Lord, Lord, they call me Lord. They do the, all kinds of things. They go to church and they do all this stuff, but they've never made it personal. They've never connected to Jesus. They've never connected to Him. To be connected to the foundation is to know Christ personally. To not know about Christ, to not even to build your house upon that foundation, if it's not connected, the wind will blow and the house can slide off. An example would be someone who, who they go to church and they believe in God, but they've never connected to it and someone comes along from another faith or another idea and they just pull them right off into some other form of life or some other form of faith. Why? Because they're not connected to it. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Another verse that I listed there is James 1.12, which says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You've got to be connected. You've got to be there with the Lord. So let me give you the application here, because as we draw this massive message to a close, these last, by the way, we've been doing this for 12 weeks. 12 weeks we've gone through this and, and what, a, what a journey it's been walking through. There's so much more to learn. But as we have this finish, as we look at the big finish that Jesus gives us, I want to give you one other passage of Scripture written by Jesus' brother as, as he talks about it in James chapter 1, verse 19, starting there. It says, <clears throat> Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and pers perseveres, being no, no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Jesus said, he who hears my word and does it is like a man who builds his house on the rock. He who hears my words and does not do it is one who builds his house on the sand. Everybody builds house. Everybody's going to have storms. But the foundation will determine if your house stands or not. 
Hearing is not enough. The difference between going to church and being the church. To simply put today, it's the difference between going to the game and playing in the game. Big difference. God calls us to get off the bench and get into the game. Do what the Word says. Get rid of the distractions, He said. Humble yourself before His Lordship. Some today, some of us need to tear down some things that we have built in the wrong places. Some of us need to just connect. We've been building in a house and we've been on the foundation of Jesus, but we've never, we've never dropped anchor into a relationship with Him. Some of us just need to get off the bench, get out of the pew, and begin to do what God has called us to do. To make a difference. To be salt and light. To become everything that you were created to be. The message of the Sermon on the Mount is be who God intended you to be. A relationship with Him and living out the Gospel in every aspect of your life. Easy? Nope. Rewarding? Oh, you have no idea. Yes. More than you could possibly know. Fulfillment of life. Joy beyond understanding. A peace that you can't get anywhere else. What needs to happen? You listen. You answer the call of Jesus. You take the step forward. You make the choice. You connect to Him. And you do what He's called you to do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, tonight...